Welcome back. It's time for another slideshow. I've got uh, some slides here on chapter 17. It's the introduction to the idea of the electrical potential. Now, the good news is we've already had a little bit of an introduction back in chapter 13 or 14 when I presented to you guys the following diagram. Let me show it to you again, just so you remember what it looks like. The idea is you've got force, electric field, electric potential energy, and electric potential. And just to sort of refresh your memory, there's a relationship between each of these concepts. So uh, if you know the force on a charge and you know its charge, you can deduce the electric field in which it's immersed by dividing the, assuming the force is an a force from an electric field, the, uh, the force is the force, the electric field, excuse me, is the force divided by the charge. Similarly, if you know the electric field, the force produced by the electric field is the electric field times the charge. Those two are straightforward. The other thing we know is that if you know that an object is immersed in a field of some kind that produces a force, the work needed to move the object from point A to point B is minus the force dotted into dr added up for all the line segments between point A and point B. In other words, it's the integral of the work needed to move the thing from point A to point B. The minus sign comes in because you're working in opposition to the force of the field, so there's a minus sign. Now, the converse concept there is that uh, if you have the potential and you want to know the force, or the potential energy, excuse me, and you want to know the force, you can take the derivative of the potential energy. That's a simple mathematical uh, inverse operation. If the change in potential energy is the integral of the force, then the force is the derivative of the potential energy. The only subtlety is that the force is a vector and the potential energy is a scalar. So if you want the x component of the force, you need to take the derivative in the x direction. If you want to know the y component, you need to take the derivative in the y direction, and so on. Now, how does electric potential fit into this picture? Electric potential is the bubble in the lower right-hand corner. And the easiest way to describe it is to say that it's the potential energy per unit charge. So much in the same way that you get electric field by dividing the force by the charge, you get electric potential by dividing the potential energy by the charge. And conversely, if you know the potential, you can get the potential energy by multiplying the potential by the charge. It seems like a straightforward definition. But understand that the fact that these are related in this way means that we can connect the electric field and the elect electric potential in a way that's similar to the way that the electric force and the electric potential energy are connected. In other words, um, if, you want, if you know the electric field and you want to know the electric potential, you can multiply by the charge, integrate, and then divide by the charge. But of course, you would notice if you did that, that you multiplied by the charge and then you just divided by the charge, so you could skip all that and just integrate. So it turns out the relationship between the electric potential and the electric field is similar to the relationship between the potential energy and the force. There's an integral along a path between point A and point B to calculate the difference in the electric potential between point A and point B. And similarly, you can take the derivative of the electric potential to deduce components of the electric field. Just like taking derivatives of the potential energy can give you components of the force, taking derivatives of the electric potential can give you components of the electric field. And that all seems very abstract and strange, so let's think of it Oh, let's think of it a little more con concretely by talking about some examples. Suppose I have a couple of plates. I'm imagining these are conducting plates of a capacitor, for example. The top plate is positively charged. The bottom plate is negatively charged. We're going to find that the electric potential in the vicinity of these plates is described well by lines of constant potential, electric potential, and let's just imagine that the bottom plate, ha we're going to define the electric potential there to be 0 volts, and we'll define the potential at the top to be 6 volts. In other words, we set things up so that there's a potential difference between the plates of 6 volts. This is easy to do in the laboratory. You just hook up a power supply and dial the knob to 6 volts, and you get this behavior. 
what has to happen in order to make that occur is that you have to get char positive charge on the upper plate and negative charge on the lower plate. But uh, <clears throat> the thing to notice is that the lines of constant electric potential are all perpendicular to the electric field lines. And that makes sense if you think about it. The electric field lines tell you which way the force acts uh, on a charge in the uh, electric field. And obviously, if you're doing work against that force, in the, it's the direction of the force that tells you which way you've got to move to do work. If you move perpendicular to the force, you do no work. But of course, if you do no work, that means the potential energy doesn't change, which means the potential energy per charge doesn't change, which means the electric potential doesn't change. So lines of constant electric potential are always perpendicular to lines of force or lines of electric field. So let's, let's ask a question. What if we wanted to know how much work it would take to move a proton from the bottom plate of this capacitor to the top plate of this capacitor. Let's say we had a free proton somehow, and we simply want to compute the work needed to do that. How would we do it? Well, we could go back and uh, to our definition of work and say, well, the work is going to be the integral of the force I need to push with dotted into the displacement as I go along, uh, add it up for all the displacements between the bottom plate and the top plate. But how do I get the force I need to push with? Well, i got to calculate the force that the field exerts on the charge, and I've got to oppose that to push the charge up. So I'm going to have a force that's minus Q times E. Now, uh, if you look at that for a second, you'll realize that the minus sign and the Q are all constant, so they can come outside the integral. And you'll also notice that the integral, the minus the integral of E dot dr, or dl, it's just the variable that tells you how you're moving along that path, uh, is nothing other than the integral in the definition of the change of the potential energy. I'm sorry, the change of the electric potential. So that means that the work is nothing other than the charge times the difference in the electric potential between the top plate and the bottom plate. In other words, we take the voltage at the top minus the voltage at the bottom, and we get the change in electric potential times the charge. That's also equal to the difference in electrical potential energy between the top and the bottom plane. It's very similar to the idea if I lift a kilogram in the gravitational field, the work I need to do to lift the kilogram through a distance of uh, one meter is equal to the difference in potential energy, gravitational potential energy, between the point where I start and the point where I stop. It's exactly the same idea. And since I know a proton has 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs of charge, if I move it through a potential difference of 6 volts, it's going to take 9.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules of work to do that, which also happens to be numerically equal to 6 electron volts. In other words, 6 electron volts is the work I need to move 6, excuse me, to move one elementary charge through a potential difference of 6 volts. Okay, so there you have it. Now, what if I want to go the other way around? What if I know the potential difference between two points in space and I want to deduce something about the electric field? Well, notice the electric field between these plates, is, at least in the middle, not too far, not too close to the edges, is basically uniform. It's constant. That means that the change in potential divided by the change in distance is a constant between the top plate and the bottom plate, or the derivative of the voltage with respect to position is constant. So if I know the distance between the two plates is a tenth of a meter, I can deduce the electric field by using the other side of the concept map that goes between electric potential and uh, electric field. So um, I get the derivative of the potential with respect to position is 6 volts divided by a tenth of a meter, or 60 volts per meter. But of course, 60 volts per meter is the same thing as 60 newtons per coulomb. So if you tell me something about how the potential is changing in space, suddenly I know how that field is going to act on different amounts of charge to produce different forces. So it's a very powerful, very powerful idea. Let's look at another problem that's related to that. Let's suppose I have a, 
a, a sphere with a, charge, a surface charge density that's constant, and I want to know something about the potential difference between two points in its neighborhood, let's say between point A and point B in this picture. So the way I work that problem is to imagine a path that goes between point A and point B. And then I envision breaking that path up into chunks and calculating the sum of the potential differences between those chunks. What I have to do is to evaluate the field at each point, dot that into the displacement along the path, multiply by minus 1, and then add those dot products up. Now, what we're doing is running this um, diagram backwards. We're going from electric field to the potential. So, notice that uh, this is you know, the same thing, just expressed in a slightly different way. Uh, let's go ahead and put in what we know the electric field is in this case. Uh, it's a point charge. Well, it's a sphere of uniform charge distribution, and we're outside the charge distribution. So we know from chapter 16 that the electric field out there is going to look like the electric field from a point charge located at the center. So we can write down that electric field. It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. The charge on the sphere divided by r squared times r hat dotted in to dl. So I'm just plugging in the pieces of this integral in order to calculate the darn thing. And I want you to think about what what is r hat dot dl going to be like. Well, you know that r hat is a unit vector that points away from the sphere, and dl is a vector that points along the path, but notice that you can break dl into components parallel to and perpendicular to r hat. In particular, the part that's parallel to r hat is going to have a size dr, the change in the distance to the center, and the perpendicular part is going to be r d theta times theta hat, where theta hat is a unit vector that points in the direction of increasing angle. But since we're taking r dot r hat dotted into delta L, the part that's perpendicular to r hat doesn't contribute. It's only the part that's parallel to r hat that matters. And so what we wind up with is just that r hat dot dl is nothing other than dr. That's the idea. So it's actually quite simple. We can just do the integral leaving out the theta hat part and uh, it becomes quite easy. It's just an integral of 1 over r squared which of course is nothing other than minus 1 over r and the two minus signs cancel and I get this simple result. So that's the idea and we'll play with this some more in class. We'll talk about the result uh, one thing that we're going to do is often refer to the potential at a point in space relative to a point at infinity. In that case, the A is going to go off to infinity, and um, B is going to be just some point near the sphere. So that's the idea. All right, so there's our diagram. We've filled in the other right, lower right-hand corner of the diagram a little more completely with this chapter. I just want to point out the basic ideas that we went over in this lesson. First of all, the electric potential is related to the electric potential energy and to the electric field. Electric field, of course, is a vector. Electric potential energy is a scalar. Um, you can compute work as charge times the change in electric potential. In other words, you can calculate the work it would take to move a charge from one point in space to a different point in space by calculating the difference in potential uh, electric potential between those two points and multiplying by the charge. That's what I mean by that. You can also calculate the electric field as the derivative of the potential at different points in space with respect to position. And finally, you can calculate the potential as an integral of electric field over space. So basically it's just pointing out these relationship that correspond to these different arrows. If you can master these different relationships, you'll be able to do anything in this chapter without any trouble. And I hope that helps. We'll see you guys in class.